I How did your that. relationship with Mike Tyson become about then? Well, I'll tell you what happened, right? I left school, like I said, when I was 14. I was on the doors at 15. And I won Irish titles. And I got Bouncer picked. at 15? Yeah, I was on the doors, yeah. Fuck's sake, know, Joe. Yeah. But I was big for my age, James. Mm. I was How big, big for my age. I was big. I was oh, wait. big. I was heavy. Yeah, I was heavy, yeah. I've always been. I've always fought the battle of the bulge. You know, mm -hmm. I love my food. Mm -hmm. You know, I always joke about the people. I always say my, my favourite meal is seconds. I, just love, <laughs> I, love, I love grub, you know. If I'm not, if I'm not training, I go huge. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, I was on the door, but I, I, I could hold my own and I was, mm. I was brave. Anyway, one night I was on the door and uh, I was working Jules Nightclub, 16 at this stage. So it was Declan Foley, Johnny McIntyre and Johnny Nugent. And they were the other three doormen. And I was saying with the barriers, and I saw two of my old school teachers coming along, Mr. Cook and Jim Doherty. You could call Jim Jim, he was a physics teacher, it was cool. Mr. Cook was the English teacher. But they used to be trendy, wearing ripped denims and clogs and ponchos. And I've hid behind, I said, oh my God, they're my school teachers. I only left school like a year before, 18 months before. So I've hid. The doormen think I'm 21. So as Declan Foley stepped out to stop them because they weren't suitably dressed for the club, ripped denims and that, he said, I'm sorry, guys, this is the dress code and you're not welcome. Mr. Cook, very posh, he goes, we're school teachers, don't judge us by our attire. Next of all, I sort of looked, the glance out. Next of all, he sees me. He goes, this is only a, and I stepped out. He was going to say, it's a teenage disco. I stepped out, I pushed Declan Foley to the side and I said, how you doing, Jim? I said, nice to see you. I said, it's all right, Declan. I said, these were my school teachers when I left school years ago, right? And I've ushered them in. I said, what are you doing? I said, they think I'm 21. I said, I'm 16 now. I said, don't worry, oh. good. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, that's some good fun on the doors. But I was big for my age. Anyway, I won an Irish title at, uh, on the 19th, junior and senior in the one year. And I got picked to go out to America. And I fought in America, I fought a, a big American Marine side. I was only 17. I fought a big American Marine sergeant called William Dawson. He was 28, big, powerful man. I was only a boy, really. I hadn't got the man strength. But I had courage, and I took a beating, stayed on my feet, took a savage beating. But um, Floyd Patterson was in attendance, who'd, who'd uh, married an Irish lady from Offaly. He took a great interest in the Irish boxing team because of his warmth and connection with Ireland. So after the fight, he came over to me and a featherweight called Paul Fitzgerald who still lives out in America now, lives in Upper Derby in Philadelphia, great federal. He won. So he impressed Floyd Patterson in winning. I don't know what I impressed him with in losing. Maybe my courage, I don't know. Anyway, he came over and he gave us the opportunity to stay on in America. I wouldn't have had the money to come back to America. So I said, yeah, I'll stay. I remember phoning my mum. I said, mum, I'm going to stay in America. Oh, son, she said, you'll never come home. I said, I'll be home next year, mum. Anyway, Floyd took us to Gleason's gym. I met Al Gavin and Bob Jackson. And I sparred a couple of pro heavyweights in Gleason's gym, a guy called Art Tucker, good pro, and another fella, I can't remember the other fella's name, gave a good account of myself. Alan Bob said there's a young heavyweight in the Catskills called Mike Tyson. He's 17, and he's looking for sparring partners. I'd never heard of Mike Tyson. I didn't know who he was. He was knocking men out left, right, and centre. He was a phenomenon, you know. But I was just so happy to hear that he was 17 years of age, mm -hmm. same age as me. As a matter of fact, he's seven months younger than me. So when I got to the Catskills with Alan Bob, I was introduced to Cuss and Camille and Marnie and Tom Patty and Jay Bright and other people there. Then I met Mike. He was younger than me, smaller than me, and he spoke with a bit of a lisp. And I thought, I'm going to bat you. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. The madness of men. Mm -hmm. I thought, I can't, oh my God, this is going to be so much fun and easy. And he was so nice because he was fascinated about the Irish history of boxing. And he was fascinated at the time of Barry McGuigan and Barry McGuigan's connection with Mr. Eastwood. It was like a father-son relationship. And he had the same relationship because it was like a father-son relationship. And I knew about Barry because Barry had been an Irish hero, world champion. So me and Mike walked and talked that night, got on great, went up to his room at the top of the house. He had the, the scene reel of the fights. He had access to the biggest collection of fight films on the planet, Bill Jacobs. Bill, Bill Kane and Jim Jacobs, his managing team, his management team, they had the biggest library of fight footage. And um, Mike had access to that library. Now, to me, there's only so much boxing you can watch. To Mike, there wasn't enough. And he used to sit on his exercise bike and he'd go, Joe, man, if that left hook could have landed, that would have changed the whole history of that weight division. And I said, oh, you know, but we walked and talked that night, watched some fights and got on really well. I was actually starting to feel sorry for him, James. I thought, I was he that. lonely? No, he wasn't. He wasn't lonely because he had he had Cuss, you know, who was like, Father, I yeah, he wasn't lonely. At the, he had Jay and Tommy's two stepbrothers, you know, and Camille and Manny's 
step parents as such, you know, cuss his family. He, he, and it was beautiful. Up, up in the Catskills, Rip Van Winkle was meant to have slept up there for 40 years. It's so tranquil and peaceful. And it's idyllic for a man that wants to train and set his mind on, on what he wants to achieve. And Mike had set his mind on being the champion of the world. Cuss had seen it in him at a young age in the Young Offender Centre. He said, that boy's going to be the champion of the world. And Cuss had already took Floyd Patterson and Jose Torres the world titles. Cuss knew his boxing. Anyway, the next morning I slept that night, slept really well. The next morning we got up and we ran, me and Mike, and jogged for about half a mile. Then he took off like a gazelle. And I thought, that's it, you tie yourself out, because I'm going to bother you later on. <laughs> right? Came back, had a bit of breakfast, went to bed till midday, got picked up then to go to the to the gym for sparring. And suddenly these big, powerful men appeared. So I thought, where have they all come from? Like, you know, but I thought, they're all going to box each other, and us two boys are going to box each other, you know? We're on the minibus. They're all very somber. I'm relaxed. I'm so happy. I'm comfortable. I'm getting minded. I'm being well looked after. I've had a great night's sleep, beautiful environment. I'm feeling comfortable with the guy that I'm going to box with, that I think I've got his measure. But these big, powerful men are sitting on the minibus, all like as if they were going to the gallows. But they knew what was coming. Stupid Paddy hadn't got a clue what was coming. You know, I didn't know what this guy was capable of. Got to the gym, warming up, shadow boxing. Cuss goes, okay, bandage up, bandage up, glove up. I'm looking around. Mike's in the ring and he had his shirt off and he was pacing the ring like the lion in the cage when you look at that lion. And he's looking out at his prey and no sparring partners were his prey. And he had his shirt off and the physique on him. James, I've never seen a physique on a 17. I've never seen a physique on a man. Don't mind the 17. You know, <laughs> his neck, his triceps, his biceps, his back, everything was just phenomenal. I hadn't seen him stripped to the waist, you know, and I just thought, there's no way a 17-year-old should look like that. Anyway, Cuss pointed to one of the big men. He got into the ring, got knocked back out. I think the first shot just pulverized him. I do tell people, I ruined a good pair of underpants at that moment. I, <laughs> I, I shit myself, you know. But I just thought, there's no way this boy should have this power. A couple more got in, and they, they got battered, knocked out. I was number four. So I got in, I lasted three minutes. I lasted longer than the three previous sparring partners. And I got out, a couple more got in. I think I sucked the sting out of his punches and I was back in again, eight or eight minutes later, two, three minutes and two more breaks. Eight minutes later, back in again. Took another three minutes beaten. So I stood with him for six minutes that day. But the madness in me, because I think the box, you've got to have that little bit of madness in you anyway. Of course. Right? And the madness in me, I thought, one of these days I'm going to get the better of him. I never did. I stayed on with him for nearly two years and he made me cry many times, <laughs> hurt me many times. But it was an honor to share the ring with him. This particular day we sparred, and there was four white sparring partners, which was unusual. Normally, there'd be some black guys. This particular day, there was four white sparring partners. You knocked three of them. I was number four. I got battered. But he didn't put me down. The end of the sparring, he goes, Joe Egan is the toughest white man on the planet. Far, far from it. I was the toughest white man in the gym that day. Mm -hmm. But what a compliment from a man like Mike Tyson. <laughs> uh -huh. 